What is up, everybody? Happy Thursday. Today's live stream is going to be packed with information, and we're going to do something we've never done before. We're going to jump on the trend of talking about trends. Okay, that sounds really crazy. We're going to gaze into our little crystal ball and kind of get a glimpse into the future. And Well, who doesn't want that? So we're going to talk about design trends today, and I'm going to tell you a little why, a little bit later, why you really need to lean into this. What images are people drawn to and what images resonate that they connect with? And how can we use what we're going to learn from our guest today to inform your next campaign, your ad, or your social post? or even the kind of images that you want to take yourself. Our guest on today's show knows a thing or two or three or ten about photography and imagery. She's the principal at Creative Services and Visual Trends Forecasting at Adobe. She helps companies with choosing leading-edge imagery. She's done presentations, moderated panel discussions on visual trends and branded content, She's a contributor to Wall Street Journal Magazine, director of visuals at Vox Media, executive photography director at Refinery29, Inc., which, Brenda, that yeah. has some significance for people, right? Refinery29? Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's a fantastic digital media brand for millennial women. Mm -hmm. It has a huge presence across social platforms. Um, I think when I was there, we we pushed it to a million followers at the time. That was almost three years ago. It's huge. Wow. And I think now there are four or five refinery channels on Instagram. It's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. I need to look into that in a little bit. I'm not even done reading your entire <laughs> resume just yet. So you are also the director of photography at Bloomberg, contributing photo editor at Time Magazine, director of photography at Rodell Men's Health Magazine, the deputy wow. photo editor at Outside Magazine, which I love and also a graduate of UC Berkeley. Everybody, please help me to welcome Brenda Millis to the show. Yeah, Brenda. Woo. Okay, that was the official introduction. All right, how are you doing? And where are you situated today? I'm great. I am here at Adobe in New York. We're downtown happily. Um, yeah, so I am a native Californian. As you mentioned, I went to Berkeley. I'm from Northern California. Mm -hmm. And have been very happily uh, in New York for pushing 20 years now. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Okay. So now, do you feel like you self-identify as a New Yorker? I do. Yeah. Well, you know, most, most of us New Yorkers aren't from here. Mm -hmm. So we're pretty, uh, we're a big variety of a bunch, which is one of the reasons why I love it here. There's a lot of variety. Awesome. Well, I don't want to take up too much time doing the little chit chat because I think you have a presentation that's going to take about 30 minutes long. So let's... Without further ado, let's just jump to that. And now the show is yours. Hey, everybody. So this is Brenda. And as we just mentioned, I'm the head of creative services and visual trends at Adobe Stock. I talk to creatives of every type about the visual trends forecast that I lead here at Adobe. Because as we all know, not only do we live in an intensely visual culture, but we're also keenly aware that our culture is changing faster than ever before. We call it here at Adobe content velocity, and mainly because of the fact that there's 24 seven media coverage and social media, social platforms are nonstop. Viewers interest is constantly shifting. And as creatives who work with any type of imagery still or moving, we need to be visually fluent. And what that means is being aware of what viewers and consumers want to look at right now, and possibly even more importantly, what they're becoming more interested in looking in or at in the future. So visual forecasting, what I do, is a combination of research practices that can actually predict where audience and viewer interest is scaling. Wow. Yeah, it's really cool. So it's, and I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later too. It's qualitative and quantitative. And mm -hmm. I'll discuss with you um, how we get all of our information, how we synthesize it around visuals. I want to know. I yeah. definitely no, want to know. Really cool. I'm, <laughs> I'm lucky. I have, you know, I'm so passionate about my job because I get to look at pictures all day and study what people are looking at. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic. So, of course, if your job is picking pictures, you need to know what people want to look at. 
And that's what I'm going to go over right now. I'm going to talk about the four major visual trends for 2019. Every year we release this before the year begins to give all the creatives kind of a heads up. But this is stuff that is absolutely the focus throughout 2019. And the first one's called Natural Instincts. And here you see a picture of nature, but it's much, much more. Mm. Natural Instincts is a visual trend that actually has everything to do with the growing role of technology in our lives. Because as technology and digitized experience is more and more part of our day every day, people are either consciously or even unconsciously trying to create more balance in their lives around the fact that we have a constant barrage of digital media and technology by becoming more drawn to images of nature. So that can be super basic, you know, something as beautiful but simple as we're looking at right now, an image, a beautiful underwater image of literally nature, but also images of people who work with natural elements, natural ingredients. So we're seeing a huge increase in people licensing images like this of makers of natural items, products, crystals, organic ingredients, organic food, um, so just as you can have images of beautiful destinations, natural items and materials gaining huge marketplace appeal, there's more to it than this. So while people are wanting to look at, buy, respond to campaigns that show, you know, people in beautiful places, spas, they're also drawn to pictures that connect them not only to nature, but what is most natural connection to themselves. So it's a kind of non-religious spiritualism, marketing beyond materialism, I've called it. Um, images that symbolize or represent people who have a profound inner connection. So think about how, you know, yoga, veganism, meditation, it was all used to be super niche. And with visual trends, what you find is all these things that used to be niche are growing and growing and growing in interest until they become of huge mass appeal. So visual trends are things that have grown in appeal and now everybody wants to do them, look at them. And that's what we're seeing here. So, you know, this picture is like such a classic wellness spa mm. picture and wellness has been huge for like, let's say four years. So what natural instincts really is, natural instincts imagery is the most evolved moment of wellness. Now, natural instinct is any kind of image that presents a healthy, happy lifestyle. And that includes not just physical wellness like we're used to, but emotional wellness, spiritual wellness. So this is a, at first seems like a funny slide, but literally images of things like crystals um, are soaring in popularity because they literally symbolize, you know, a profound connection to self. So what you're starting to see with natural instincts is this giant range of any type of imagery that conveys healthy, happy, natural lifestyles. And then what we do at Adobe is we track search history for different stock pictures. And then there's just a few uh, search terms I put up. So all of these numbers are how much search has increased over the last year. In 2018, we tracked. So veganism, 93% increase, introspection, self-care, intention, all of these, there are hundreds, all of these terms relevant to natural instincts are just scaling. And this is some of the kind of quantitative data that we track. Now, in terms of um, campaigns and industries, I want to show you two very different types of industry examples to show you how vast the appeal of natural instincts is. So I work with a lot of clients who are interested in interior design, home decor, and I'm actually really fascinated by how natural instincts is soaring while simultaneously home tech is taking off. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy. And and the next slide, we'll see something that's very techy that totally fits into this. So if you think about it, the notion of home is changing. So even though for ages, it's always been you know, the safe, 
comfortable environment. Now it's becoming more of like a technological hub, right? We've right. got lighting, heating, security, you can control everything, you know, um, with tech. And then simultaneously, once again, people trying to create balance in their lives, people are starting to really decorate their homes with these kind of earth tones, botanical prints, beautiful landscapes, macros of like genomes and crystals to give it this like natural vibe. And yet, guess who else is doing that? Home tech. This is a Google picture from their software line. So they're doing all this, these campaigns with like these soft, nubbly, earth tone sweaters, you know, and all of their home tech is rounded and textured. You want to touch it. So home tech is being, as usual, really savvy and making all of their home tech feel really cozy and earthy. And actually, they're jumping in and participating in the natural instincts trend as well. Like that's almost kind of the last place instinctually you would think of tech, but they know how appealing and huge this trend is. And then changing gears, it makes a ton of sense for beauty to be jumping in on this trend because, you know, just as you want to surround yourself at home with comfort and um, natural feelings, what you put in or on your body more and more is something people are aware of being healthy, organic, and beauty has very much followed suit. And it's not just the organic ingredients that beauty products are touting. They're also changing their packaging. So we're seeing, as you can see with um, both of these product shots, we're seeing Total Beauty, Le Labo, two real cult beauty um, companies, Le Labo, Oh, is actually huge. It's owned by Estee Lauder now. They're packaging their perfumes and their oils like 70s essential oils. So they're really kind of doing this retro organics nature thing to appeal to people, to make people feel like they're buying something pure, trustworthy, artisanal. You see Total Beauty's first campaign. It's actually shot by Inez and Venude, so there's a lot of budget behind it. Beautiful landscapes you're seeing on, on the website a stock picture here of a tight beauty close up. So all of this is, you know, soaring in popularity and it's all under natural instincts. I'm gonna move on now to creative democracy. Again, keep in mind, I just talked about how natural instincts is a visual trend that's actually a reaction to technology. And here's creative democracy and we'll see it looks and feels very different but it's also a visual trend that is born very organically, um, no pun intended, natural instincts, but organically from technology. So because of smartphones, because of user-friendly creative apps, we're seeing this huge renaissance in creativity that's totally democratized and totally organic. Gen Z and millennials started this by, you know, snapping pictures of their friends, their family, their community every day, and sharing them on social. And as we all know, that's become such a huge way of viewing and ingesting visuals that this creative democracy has actually become its own visual trend with really recognizable elements. We see vivid colors, we're super used to that. We see color blocking, but we also now see people of every generation, because let's face it, anybody who has a smartphone is creating these kinds of pictures. So from Gen Z, teenagers to baby boomers, people you know in their mid to late 60s, every age and every body type, ethnicity, is part of this creative democracy aesthetic. Because again, people are taking pictures of their friends, their family, community, and it's just spread like wildfire. So the stylistic ingredients here make complete sense. Authenticity, these are like snapshot moments because it really is just sharing your, your life. Authenticity, diversity of all types, um, vivid color and color blocking. These are the elements of now a visual trend style that is going way beyond social and I, we call it, you know, social beyond the screen. This is a visual type that you're seeing everywhere. 
and it really dominates. Um, something to me that's a big deal is for generations, fashion dictated color trends across all creative industry. And now as of 2018, social is totally dominating and dictating what the color trends are. And that's a huge shift. And again, just some um, search terms, you see how much these really relevant search terms to creative democracy have just flown off the charts. Gen Z has gone up 207%, inclusivity, spontaneity, which again is huge. People are just loving the snapshot spontaneous vibe because they're really tired of overly produced campaigns. So that authentic, diverse, bright color feel is just taking off. And then something I just want to stress, creative democracy is kind of a one, two, three pump, and this is why it's so powerful. You have people snapping hundreds of pictures a day, sharing, which is distribution, across all these mobile apps, and then presentation. What, where people are watching and looking is shifting, but it's not shrinking, it's expanding. And so the presence of video and the role of YouTube just cannot be stressed enough. Let's face it, Gen Z only watches TV on, on YouTube. And so we're not just talking about Instagram anymore. We're not just talking about Facebook anymore, obviously. But YouTube is such a major player. And with creative democracy, movement is the dominant asset type. Movement moves people. It gets people's interest. It takes time to watch and it retains people's interest because again, they want to see what happens. So I'm just gonna go through a couple campaigns to give you some examples of creative oh. democracy in action and ads. Um, this is a slide from HIMS campaign, which I love, direct uh, DTC, direct to consumer brand, which as we know on Instagram is, is huge. A lot of us just do our most of our shopping now through Instagram campaigns. Kim's is hugely successful, and it's totally all creative democracy. We see diversity, we see color blocking, we um, see you know funny, authentic moments, emojis. Same thing with Bonobos, incredibly successful direct to consumers, men's fashion brand. They have a campaign that's called However You Fit, which is kind of a double entendre on the way clothes fit you with a range of body types, but also alludes to the fact that there's an ever-growing range of diverse masculine identities. So like hymns, Bonobos ads incorporate the fund fundamental elements of creative di diversity, color blocking, look at this casting, it's amazing. And the campaign includes stills and video released across every type of media channel. And I'm gonna show you now a quick video to just give you the vibe of what you would see for Bonobos. I don't wanna be an imitating man. Okay, so that's that. That's pretty cool. It is cool, right? Yeah. And I'll get so back it's, to a, it's a slow panning shot, presumably, yep. People stitched in there via compositing, just swapping out yeah. different types. Yeah. They're showing diversity and inclusion and just a very kind of natural lighting style, uh, something that's very against what might have happened 10, 20 years ago, which exactly. is the really super slick images and everybody's exactly. perfect looking. So we've seen then example, a couple examples of creative democracy kind of in its natural habitat, which is direct to consumer you know, very Instagram friendly. But what I want to share now is a really interesting example to me, which is how do legacy brands, brands that aren't digitally native, how do they incorporate creative democracy since it is so social friendly, et cetera. So beyond the logical fit, I want to take a look at Tommy Hilfiger, um, a company with a, a really longstanding heritage. Mm -hmm. and how they just kind of pull specific elements from creative democracy to refresh rather than rebrand. And I just kind of love this because, and we'll talk about it later, kind of 
the strategy of how do you identify a visual trend being good for a project, but not just kind of use it whole hog and then make it look like it's just a trend and not really branded with your company, your project's look. So what we're going to look at here, what we see here is a still from Tommy's summer 2018 drive collection and campaign. And clearly drives inspired by an all American favorite pastime race car driving, which is squarely in Tommy Hilfiger's Americana wheelhouse. And just in this first image, we see Gigi Hadid, a huge supermodel influencer, and Lewis Hamilton, another social influencer, but with a totally different audience. He's a famous race car driver, two big influencers with different younger audiences. And these are the global brand ambassadors for Tommy Hilfiger. So right away we see him using Instagram influencers with a nod and a hook into social. So they're wearing clothes from the drive collection. This is shot on a racetrack and let's keep going. What we see then in this slide is the slicky slick on the right, Gigi Hadid, more polished campaign shot, but it's against color blocking. And we, start, we see on the upper left, there's all these behind the scenes videos that they're presenting strictly on YouTube. So Tommy Hilfiger's done something really smart, which is structuring this whole drive campaign with a 360 degree presence across all media platforms. So it's print, it's TV, but there's also a whole series of coverage that's strictly YouTube, strictly Instagram. Um, so they're really going for authenticity, but they're also using the color blocking, the diverse casting, the influencer, all creative democracy moves. So now I'm going to show you a quick video that's YouTube only that again goes behind the scenes, makes people feel like they're part of this world, but it feels very authentic. <laughs> We saw a whole bunch of moves there that were very much in the wheelhouse of both Tommy Hilfiger, but also creative democracy. You know, you see this behind the scenes kind of immersive, authentic vision of Gigi Hadid. Here she is helping design, helping design the whole collection. You see how branded it is with Gigi times Tommy. You see at the end, Gigi you know, shooting a selfie, the color blocking over those selfies, the red, the clear, the blue. So you're really seeing all the parts of creative democracy, but totally branded for Tommy. And I just think it's pretty brilliant that he's really kind of refreshing the whole Hill figure look by, and yet staying totally on brand. And we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that's really the crux of working with visual trends is figuring out which parts of a visual trend work for your the brand project you're working on or your own creative style and weaving those in to get viewer interest but staying true to your own style. The next trend is called disruptive expression and it's actually a branch of creative democracy but it's so intense and so powerful and of such um, interest to viewers and consumers that we're giving it its own trend. Now, as I said, so many people are now becoming creatives, maybe without even knowing it, but so many of us spend a lot of our day taking pictures, sharing them across social, that the basically it's mainstream culture has gotten to a kind of a comfort level with being creative. And because we've reached a stage where we aren't just used to expressing ourselves publicly and creatively, but are feeling confident as creators, that being creative is very much the norm. Now, as, as multiple identities and cultures are now being accepted, and inclusivity is not just embraced these days, but expected, a lot of shame has eroded and self-expression is really blossoming. And it's the combination then of confident creativity and kind of well-rehearsed now self-expression across social that has led to disruptive expression. 
I'm showing you an Adobe stock picture of somebody creating graffiti because disruptive expression is a lot like graffiti. It used to be kind of this outlaw artistic expression, this intensity, but now it's something that people consider an art form. So intent, confident, personal expression, very passionate, it's a, nat a natural attention getter. And we are finding that viewers are really hooking into that because with this intensity and this passion visually, it cuts through the constant barrage of media visuals. And that's really what you want when you're presenting images. You wanna cut through the constant you know, barrage, the 24 seven pictures that everybody sees. You want people to stop on your picture, look, and really unpack what you're saying. And disruptive expression, these kinds of intense personal expressions of creativity do exactly that. There's a lot to look at. There's a lot to understand. Viewers really stay on these pictures. And that's what really makes for successful image is viewer interest and retaining viewer interest. And just as there are a lot of different types of people, cultures and art forms, there's a huge range of imagery in this trend that we're calling disruptive expression. They range from quite serious, um, very militantly political messaging to very playful and whimsical. Because again, self-expression can take many forms. It's the intensity that really makes disruptive expression its own visual type. Um, it's kind of a balancing act that I think is really pretty brilliant of aesthetics and, aggress and aggression. So it's kind of beautifully aesthetic, but it's also very in your face aggressive. And again, I'll show you some increases of keyword searches here at Adobe Stock. So we've doubled, doubled the search of provocation um, expectation, radical, and disruptive are all have all shot up. So again, it's these search words that convey intensity, um, passion, disruptive. So disruptive expression is something that is intense, gets your intention, and really kind of sh shifts the norm. Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple great examples of disruptive expression at work in campaigns to really show you the range of how people are working with this type of visual now. Okay, so that's like one of my favorite campaigns of the year, just to let everybody know, and I, I just, I have slightly odd taste. Um, I, I did. A, I studied a lot of surrealism in college, so that kind of that makes scratched. sense. <laughs> but you know, this again gets your it gets your attention. Um, it's literally transformative, and people, no matter if they like it or if they don't, they're going to stop and watch this. Right? Mm -hmm. It gets your attention, and it's pure whimsy. It's just like doing something odd to do something odd and artistic. That's disruptive expression. And then we have completely different, a campaign that launched, I think it launched um, the night of the Academy Awards, which is Nike's amazing dream crazier campaign. Um, incredible. I'm going to share this with you now. I'm sure everybody's probably seen it, but it's really amazing. If we show emotion, we're called dramatic. We've now seen two very, very different kinds of videos. And this Dream Crazier campaign is very disruptive. It's passionate. It has a very specific point of view. I, you know, coming from a stock point of view, virtually all of that footage, by the way, is, is archival, you know, sports footage. Um, so there's a couple things here. You know, you can make an amazing campaign using, you know, vintage stock footage, which is amazing. But it's just that this is exactly what visual trends are. Um, you know, this feminism movement and diversity, inclusion, these were all considered kind of fringe movements, moments, and we're at a tipping point. You know, mass culture, mainstream 
culture is demanding diversity and inclusivity. That's not a trend. That's not going away. But what is trending is the style of this campaign. It's passionate. It has a very specific point of view. It gets your attention. It retains it. It drives home the message. And it transforms the status quo. So I think that's brilliant. I also am presenting it now because Dream Crazier is not just part of disruptive expression. It's part of what could be the biggest visual trend of the year, brand stand. And something to understand about visuals and what is trending um, is that people are interested in types of images that can belong to more than one trend. So what people are interested in doesn't just have to fit into one box or another. So with Dream Crazier, we're seeing disruptive expression, passionate, specific point of view that um, is intense and gets people's interest. And then we're also seeing that it fits into brand stand, which is visuals and image types that convey brand's purpose or brand's role in social and environmental issues. This is huge. Um, I think we're probably, once I get going and talking about this, we're all pretty aware of it, but I'm not sure that everybody is really conscious of exactly how it's being communicated. And that's, you know, that's my role to talk about how brands are working with images that convey company support of social and environmental issues. And the fact is that more and more brand loyalty is being determined not only by the products and the services that companies create and sell, but more and more around the role or the business practices that companies um, that companies communicate that they're taking part in. So that obviously for some years now, people have been aware of, you know, where, how food is being sourced, for example. And that is expanding more and more to people wanting to understand um, how companies are sourcing the ingredients, how their business practices are impacting people and the planet. And because we live in a visual culture, many companies are, are quick to understand that role, the, the role that images play because images instantly communicate um, companies messaging so they can instantly communicate brands roles in social issues, sustainability and responsible business practices. So marketplace appeal of these types of images has scaled hugely over the last year and just continues to increase. And the reason why I'm showing you these four pictures right now is these are really different types of images. And what's important to understand about pictures and videos in Grandstand is there are many different kinds of images that fit into this visual trend. Because a company may be like a, like a Madewell or an Adidas, they're creating, uh, they're using material created out of um, plastics that they find in the ocean. So, the picture on the top right might be great for a fashion brand that's using recycled plastics in their um, textiles. But if you're talking about community service and the role your company plays in community service, you see the top left, wildlife conservation, bottom right, and then support of gender identities and changing family structures, bottom left. So depending on the messaging of your company and your brand, you're going to be working with different kinds of imagery. And the reason, of course, that I'm so aware of this is that Adobe Stock has millions and millions of pictures. I think over 150 million pictures. Wow. And we're seeing, yeah, we're seeing people license um, very different kinds of pictures, but like, again, like these three that you're now seeing, pictures that clearly represent um, social equality, you see solar power here, wildlife conservation. So we're seeing, you know, we track all of this. We see a pattern in social and environmental issues that are represented by imagery. And we also see some campaigns going completely viral now that are very much brand stands. Once again, Nike, 
very bold company. You know, their motto is just do it. But this was the first campaign in North America that was a brand stand campaign and it was everywhere. Um, this picture of Colin Kaepernick, by the way, is a stock image. Um, just shows you how powerful stock can be. So it's a stock picture of Colin with a very simple message around this, the public stance he took. And it created both positive and negative reactions. But the fact is that everybody was talking about this. And in the end, this was a fantastic campaign for Nike. They were one of the first North American camp brands to really take a stand around a social issue. But I also want to point out that because the first couple of North American campaigns were in fact controversial, there was this campaign, there was the Gillette, um, be the best man can be. Mm -hmm. So the first two big North American brandstand campaigns, you know, kind of stirred the pot as far as different reactions. And so I think there was an immediate misconception of brandstand as being controversial by nature. But really what Brandstand is, is it's just a way of communicating your brand's role that's consistent with what your company does. So I'm going to show you something very different now <laughs> that is also a brand stand campaign. So a company that creates and sells childcare products can also take a stand around um, their role in social issues. So let's take a look now at a Pampers ad. That I think you'll Well, enjoy. that's different. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, hold on. Hi, baby boy. Somebody's got a stinky boo. I'm gonna need some backup on this one. Okay, so that was completely different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the point is, I want to show you two totally different commercials, campaigns, because Pampers here is very much taking part of Brand Stand. The campaign name, as you saw at the very end of that clip, is called Love the Change. And that is, people love puns, love the change, meaning change the diaper. Right. But very much love the change that now men, fathers, are taking part in raising children, getting into the nitty gritty, you know, the worst of which does tend to be changing the diapers. So what they're saying is there's, this is a, a funny, lovable celebration of the fact that fathers are now taking part in child rearing, which is fantastic. That's a brand stand. So I just wanted to show that um, because so many people think that when they hear brand stand, you know, they think of politics, they think of, you know, again, very aggressive, but it can be super, you know, lifestyle, fun, lovey-dovey. It really is just communicating with your customer base and becoming even maybe more appealing to a growing customer base of, look, this is what we do, and this is how we support social equality. This is how we help clean up the planet. So what Brandstand does at the end of the day is it helps companies improve their communication with their customers in a slightly different way than previously because it's sharing brand, their brand's, you know, sustainable business practices. It's becoming more transparent around what they stand for, but what it does is super powerful. And this is why we're seeing it everywhere. It shifts people's awareness of your brand. So they might like your brand in the beginning, but what happens when you work with brand stands successfully is that it makes people love your brand. So I go from, hey, yeah, Pampers is an option to buy, but now I love the fact that they're celebrating fathers taking part in child rearing. I'm going to buy the Pampers. You know, so it's authentic, though. You know, it's, it's authentic. It's not just, hey, we're going to take a stand to appeal to more people. It's like, look, this is what we stand for, and this is what's so great about taking care of children now. And this is gender equality. So... The point here is that this is a powerful messaging, but it also has to be authentic. So brand stand visuals are not successful if they're employed just for the sake of taking a stand, because let's face it, viewers and consumers, especially Gen Z and millennials, they're keenly aware of being marketed to. And if it's not authentic, if it's not relevant, they're going to call you on it. And it's, it's going to be, you know, it just be, would be a horrible disaster PR wise, of course. But um, if you are authentic in your messaging 
and you really are conveying to people, you know, something that's relevant to people, the planet, and your company, it's really going to create brand loyalty in a really profound way and long term. So really brand stand is kind of like it's good for the people, it's good for the planet. And yeah, let's face it, it's good for profits. And that really is a complete win win. And then just to wrap it up, here are some search terms that we're seeing spiking in terms of brand stands and some pictures to show you a real, once again, like with all of these trends, there's a real range in imagery types that are very much within, as I always say, the wheelhouse of this trend. And that pretty much wraps it up for the four trends of 2019. Awesome. Great job. Woo! Yeah, Brenda. <laughs> Okay, I've got a lot of questions. I want to make yeah, sure, sure that those people that are listening can go ahead and start submitting your questions and we'll do our best to chat with you. Go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so I'll give you guys some time to think as you absorb all that wonderful information that Brenda shared with us. I think I want to start at the end of this thing because this is not my view, but this is a view I hear quite a bit. Okay, so when you talk about a brand stand, it's easy to kind of be cynical and say is this genuine or is this the marketing department telling you this is yeah. trending right now right so how do we figure that out because even in the case of pampers it sure. wasn't that they've been talking about men and, and a definition of masculinity masculinity as one that's being a nurturing loving father who's an equal in the household and participating in the parenting role this is something that is trending today so they're going to be seen as jumping on that trend. And even John Legend and Adam Levine who are in it, it's like, yeah. what, what kind of blowback do those guys get? So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, as I said, you know, viewers and consumers, we're all savvy mm -hmm. and we're all very consciously taking part in a consumer culture. So nobody's pretending or disguising the fact that this is marketing. Guess what? Any commercial is marketing. Any campaign is marketing. Right. It's just that the message has to be on brand right. for your company and have meaning in terms of how your company fits in the world and how consumers already think about the product and services that you offer. So it really just has to be on message, relevant and engaging. Again, all of us know that if we're watching a commercial, we're being marketed to and that people are trying to sell us things, but it has to engage us and be on message for the company and the company's history and its offerings. So I just think of it in those terms that nobody's trying to hide the fact that they're messaging and marketing, but it has to hit the target that people expect from that company. Mm. So this is a very delicate balancing act, I think. Yeah. Oh, totally. What's on trend? Will this yeah. resonate? And will people yeah. see you as being authentic and genuine when you put this thing out there? So it can be a yeah. little risky. You're marketing in the first right? place. Marketing, absolutely. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Nike is so interesting yes. because they're going to be bold. Again, like I said in my overview, their motto is just do it. And they're talking about intense, you know, athletes, world famous athletes who take risks every day. So it makes sense that Nike is going to take a risk in their own campaign. That's on brand and on message for everything they stand for. Mm -hmm. So that's why to me, that was so successful. They're bold. They are bold. But if Pampers did that, everybody would just be out out you know <laughs> if they we did that lovable. we want cute babies we right. want john lynch singing to us right We're right good. if yeah. they did that dare i use the pun of double entendre the yeah. s might hit the fan that's right right Thank the you. s would hit the there fan you go. okay <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. Well, I, I got to talk to you a little bit since you were bringing up Colin Kaepernick in that campaign. Yeah. There was a strong backlash against that yeah. and their sales dipped for a little bit. People were burning their shoes. Yeah, they were literally burning their shoes. Pressed. That got pressed though, didn't it? it? Did. In other words, it kind of supports at the end of the day, the no press is bad or no publicity is bad publicity, I think the saying is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Nike... Nike took a chance and in the end they, they did shine. But the fact is 
people were all over social saying, hey, look, burning shoes, burning shoes. Guess what they were talking about? Nike. You know, right. for, me, for me, that's a win. And um, again, they're bold. They're bold beginning and the end of the day. Dream Crazier is also very bold. Um, also inspiring. They're they're willing to take that chance because it's who they are. Yeah. So it's successful. Right. Yeah. Okay. So now I have this question for you. If I'm watching this, I'm a company, I'm a brand, and I want to take my brand stand. Yeah. Your role at Adobe, is this something that you offer yeah. out as a as an advisor, a consultant? Like how do companies work with you? Or they, can they? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. No, okay. That's, that's, that's part of my position here at Adobe Stock is um, I work with enterprise clients, meaning large global companies um, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So it could be as simple as me just giving your company this the overview of this. But I also do client deep dives where I work with their style guidelines, their visual guidelines. We you know, take a deep dive together and these are the trends. Here are the elements that I see on brand. We strategize about what does and doesn't work in terms of you wouldn't ever want to take a trend on whole hog that just doesn't make sense. It's about refreshing rather mm -hmm. than revolutionizing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I work one on one with clients all the time. Right. But you're talking about global enterprise. That means almost everybody watching this channel. Yeah. Too bad. So sad. <laughs> right? Because, you know, that's something that I really want to talk to you about yeah. because while what I while I do this research year long and it's a deep dive for me, working with trends is, isn't rocket science. And creatives are very good just by nature in understanding their own style, understanding what's on point for them, and seeing where these trends can fit into either their own personal work, yes, in terms of color palette. Or, you know, if, if somebody's like, God, I've been really thinking about getting into video, this would be the time because now I'm seeing that video is what's really getting people's attention and retaining it on social, mm -hmm. you know, or I've been, you know, starting to work with more color blocking and a vivid color palette. Oh, okay. That's something that people are responding to or natural instincts. Wow. I've, you know, been working on a whole series of projects around, you know, connection or meditation or something organic. So you just start to see the el which, first of all, which trends are relevant to your work or relevant to a project you're working on for a company, whether freelance or staff, seeing which trend is actually relevant at all, but then starting to kind of parse that out, you know, with wellness, look, that could be for, you know, a luxury spa, but it could also be for, you know, if you're starting a yoga studio, if you're, you know, maybe launching a small product, you know that people aren't responding to slicky slick product marketing anymore, that they're really, really responding to stuff that's natural, rounded shapes, something that's organic. So you start to see where your where your own projects fit in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it could fit into a couple. Okay, I wanna do this thing. Jonah, go full frame by me. Uh, I'm gonna go, is it this side, Jonah, or is it this side? For what? Uh, let's just pretend like you can read your chat over here. Sorry, you just brushed it right yes, there. It's on the yeah, okay. Time. Oh, oh let's look, let's answer that question right there. <laughs> okay, now that we've done that, I want to say this, Brenda. You are making me super self conscious right now because you are so on trend. Look, let's look, let's do the split screen. You are so on trend. Let's talk about this. Actually, let's just go full screen so I could do a full visual analysis for our audience. Look at Brenda, she's very natural. Yes. I Her am. glasses are on trend, the big oversized glasses. She's wearing that kind of designer chic black shirt. And she's got a color block background, the, the bright chartreuse green and the white. That's where I work. Hey, man, <laughs> whatever. And, and she's <laughs> underproduced. It's like a very natural look, right? Earthy tones. Earthy tones. Now come back to me, Jonah. Here we are in the studio, ah! you know, with the lighting and everything that we're going. We're overproducing the show. We're off trend. We're not on trend, Jonah. Not on trend. Not on brand. That's it. Oh we, we need to like step up or step down our game. Step we have down. to. This professional <laughs> mic, the headset, we just got to go lo-fi. Okay. Lo -fi. All right. So enough joking around. I do want to ask you this question. How do you define what is a trend? What oh, indicators oh are you well, looking at? You're asking that. No, there we I'm go. so glad you're asking that because I, like many people in any industry, I inherit certain terms, you know, um, I work with stock photography. Stock is a term, you know, for 
images that exist that you can license to use. Um, visual trends is a term I inherited from the industry. And the very word trend is something that is troublesome because it can very easily and immediately be misinterpreted. So when we talk about visual trends, we're not talking something similar to fashion trends, which can be here today, gone tomorrow. When we're talking about visual trends, we're talking about images, types of images that are slowly but surely or quickly trending in popularity. So the word trend here refers to rising in appeal, mm. rising commercial appeal. Now the trend may be around for a really long time. In fact, it usually is. But the word visual trend, what it means is it's something that used to be super fringe, you know, niche, um, and then has scaled an interest. And by the time we say, look, this is a visual trend for 2019, what it means is a visual trend is squarely in mainstream. It's of huge interest to mass culture. So it's kind of what it represents is a tipping point. You've gone from some people are interested in this type of image to everybody is responding to this type of image. Now, if you're not playing in these trends, you're, you're sorely missing out and you don't, you won't seem like you're visually fluent. You won't seem like you know what's going on in the visual culture. You're out of touch. Yeah. To yeah. be honest, you're not, you're not up to date. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So here's the thing. I, I'm glad you said that because yeah. if you say your design is trendy, that's right. usually a negative yeah. statement. It means yeah. that you're jumping onto something and it's already over or it's indicative of a certain time period and you're you're doing something yeah. that's very dated. You're talking yeah. about something very different. I think if I understand it correctly, there's a shift in what people are considering contemporary and of the moment. So for example, uh, this is a horrible example, but I'm just gonna, I just can't think of a better one. Like if you own slaves, that's now not trendy anymore and you're way, way behind. If you, you hold on to deep rooted, racism and prejudice that's you're not fitting within our the the part of the zeitgeist or what we would consider a modern human being right it's, it's it's not just it's not just popular it's expected yeah so for example throughout these trends mm -hmm. we see diversity and inclusion yeah because that's just that is part of social standards now um so you'll see diversity of all types throughout all of these trends. That is just part of what a, an image is now. You know, we take pictures of people of all identities, all backgrounds, mm -hmm. diversity is throughout. So what I'm really addressing are, are, are visual trends that are, as you said, you, you use a great word, zeitgeist. You know, if you're not, if any of these trends is relevant to your work and you're not dipping into them, you are going to be considered out of touch and that's why we talk at Adobe a lot about visual fluency, that visual trends, knowing visual trends helps you become and remain visually fluent mm. so that to be aware of the fact that these are all out there and all super popular is necessary to consider them for your work wherever relevant. Oh, okay, okay. This is, uh, I'm starting to think about this a little bit differently. I think we almost need to like define a different term. Sure. Maybe it's instead of using the word trend mm -hmm. to say it's you're you're visual visually fluent and you're culturally relevant. Yes, that's, that's exactly. what we're talking about. That's great. No, that's great. And that's why I said sometimes it's so hard for anybody in the creative industry or any industry to inherit these terms because some of these words like trend, it has other meanings. So we're talking about something that's trending in interest. So, yeah, it's that. And so that's why Adobe has coin the term visually fluent whenever we're talking about visual forecast because you have to stay culturally relevant as you just pointed out. Perfect. Okay, I know we've taken up a lot of your time so I have two more questions for you and I'm gonna get real selfish for our audience who's listening to this and like, okay, this is super great. Obviously, I'm not an enterprise global company. I can't hire Brenda to oh. help me out, right? But I think just I want to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that you're coming on our show, you're giving this presentation so that you, the internet, can have this information that you might not have access to, yeah. right? So let's acknowledge that. But here are the two questions, and it's a two-parter. So first question is this, is that what kinds of trends in photography creation and consumption can you point out that might be relevant to 
some young person in the middle of the country who's maybe had a couple of years of design training, how can they learn from what it is that you're sharing so they can participate in this? And how can they use the information from today to inform mm -hmm. what they do moving forward? Now, I know how we're going to, we're going to lo-fi the set a little bit, maybe to mm -hmm. kind of capture that in the moment behind the scenes part. So can you give us like really tactical things that might help somebody that's maybe not in that level yet where they can apply what it is that they're learning today? Yeah, I mean, okay, let's think about it. Mm -hmm. Let's think we talked about natural trends mm -hmm. or natural instincts rather as the first trend. So that's any kind of imagery that communicates a connection to nature or a connection to oneself. And that's almost more about, you know, you can be anybody creating imagery or design that has a natural feel or an organic feel. That's really what we're talking about is that because people are looking at all these like dealing with technology day after day, digitized experience, they're really finding refuge in any work that feels and looks natural or organic or helps you feel like you're in touch with yourself. That can, as I kind of tried to show with each of these trends, that can look like anything. It's, it's the message. But with design, we've talked about earth tones, we've talked about plants, landscapes. Um, that's, again, that's pretty vast. It's just about leading a healthy, happy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, brand stamps, social environmental issues. Again, it's not a look and feel, it's a messaging. Now, creative democracy and disruptive expression are kind of linked, and that's really about authenticity, vivid colors, video, mm. for creative democracy across social platforms, immersive experience. Mm -hmm. And then dis disruptive expression is really passionate expression, intense, almost aggressive artistic expression. So it's really kind of just keeping those the those elements in mind they can t i've tried to show with the different adobe stock pictures that image wise there's a lot of fluidity there you know it's just falling into what that messaging is mm -hmm. perfect awesome oh my god it's so good okay i'm just writing some notes here as you might be seeing me like tapping away at my keyboard because I usually do the summary at the end of the show. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to first let everybody know how to get in touch with you. I, I just, guys, let's give Brenda a big round of applause for being on the show before we say goodbye. Now, before we say goodbye, this is how you can get in touch with Brenda Millis. You can follow her on Instagram at BAM11215. It is a mystery what 11215 means. I won't tell you guys. But you can also check out Adobe Stock and go to stock.adobe.com. So here we go. We're going to wrap up the show. I'm going to give you guys a summary of everything I learned. It cannot be contained on two pages. I broke into three pages, which is pretty rare. So we're going to go through this lightning speed. People are drawn to nature, which you just said. There's this organic appeal, and it's a reaction to all the technology and how we're kind of getting lost in that world. And we want to move beyond materialism. So we're seeking healthy, happy, natural lifestyle, and we can see that in everything from packaging, graphics, and photography, photography, style, and subject. There's, a, there's a, a, an attraction towards spiritual and emotional wellness. Words that are trending, veganism, introspection, self-care, intention. You talked about the calm house, and it's ironic that some tech companies are really tapping into this with the rounded corners, the surfaces like touch me, feel me. They're very pillowy. The old ideas of technology and industrial design are going away. There's this idea about creative democracy, which started out as people doing selfies and doing using low-tech software or hardware to capture images. But it's created this really beautiful space where you can have these authentic snapshots. Spontaneity is really important, just kind of being in the moment of the moment. You talked about social now influencing fashion and not the other way around. So colors, patterns, things like that, drawing from social. There's, you said that movement, whether it be video or animation, is dominant. That's going to have to be part two of this thing because we didn't really even get into that, but yeah. it's awesome. Uh, overproduce feels inauthentic. That's one of my key takeaways. And you want to give people a behind-the-scenes peek at what's going on, some of the campaigns you shared with us. And you talked about how they're using stock to tell their story, which is really awesome because it's empowering to know that you can come up with an amazing idea and find stock to tell that story. You don't have to produce it all yourself. Other words that you talked about, confident, intense, disruptive, 
creative self-expression. And there's this mixture between, in that kind of self-expression space, something that's really beautiful and aggressive. So it's a combination of aesthetics and something that's really raw. Other words, provocation, expectation, and radical. Including people in it, what it is that you're doing by being very transparent about social or environmental causes that you care about. And I love this expression or this term, brand stand. It's not exploiting controversy for controversy's sake because you got to do it in a way that's consistent with your culture. And the last but not least summary here is we need to rethink how we talk about trends. And I think both uses are valid. It's just we need to understand which one we're talking about. Trend number one is saying that design is dated and out of touch with what's going on or that kind of thinking. Yeah. You're unaware. You're not fluent with what's going on. And trend number two is the opposite of that, which is it's almost expected of you now to be visually fluent, to be keeping up with the times and to be culturally relevant. Thank you so much, Brenda. I'm going to say goodbye to you. We're going to play the music. And thank you so much for coming on our show and sharing so much knowledge. One more time, guys. Woo! Yes. Okay. I'm going to tell everybody, let me find the music. I'm a little rusty here. Where's my music? There we go. Don't forget to like, Aaron, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you very much to everybody that's a sustaining member. See you guys later. Okay. We're good? Yeah, okay, we're, okay. We're All right. Woo! Thank you very much.